All right, so um, let's just uh, get into the talk for tonight. Um, so I want to welcome Mark Horowitz uh, back. Uh, he was our inaugural speaker for the series last year, um, and he is joined tonight by his colleague, Anthony Hayner. Uh, I'll read a little bit about Mark here. He is an associate professor of sociology at Seton Hall University. His research, his research interests include biosociology, political economy, and the sociology of knowledge. He's published across disciplinary fields in such journals as Current Anthropology, Sociological Spectrum, and Review of Radical Political Economies. Anthony Hayner uh, is an associate professor of sociology at Seton Hall University as well. His research interests include civilizational prospects, integrated human science, and the Catholic intellectual tradition. He is published on social theory, transhumanism, and Catholic social thought, and is author of Social Practice, Philosophy, and Method. So uh, I want to thank them for coming out uh, to Westchester from New Jersey. And uh, without further ado, Mark and Anthony. Thank you, Greg. Um, Anthony and I are thrilled to be here, um, despite the fact that the topic uh, may be a bit depressing. Um, you'll notice that title changed from the title that was advertised. Is this a college degree worth it? It was sort of an advertising ploy, although our talk does link to that question. Um, if you do explore it, you'll discover that even with some of the changes in the larger economy that we might touch on a little bit later in the talk, a college degree is still, from a strict economic calculus, worth it. Uh, I encountered a variety of different numbers, but usually about $30,000 a year, for example, you'll earn more with a college degree um, than you would if you didn't have one. Of course, that's presuming that the only reason for a college degree would be job skills, and that, that itself is a sort of larger question to discuss. Uh, both Anthony and I believe in the importance of a civic mission as well is equally important uh, for a college degree. But we are deeply concerned that um, there are forces undermining the standards in higher education. This is something both of us experienced in our teaching career. And as we were carrying out a larger survey project on controversies within particular academic fields, we started to reflect on it and think, wow, are we the only ones that are really worried about what's happening to academic standards. And uh, it's certainly visible in the larger political culture if you're uh, paying attention to things. Uh, I did need to leave and go to the Google links. I don't know if that, that'll be a problem. I, I should have, I neglected to ask that, Matt. So if I hit escape, I should be okay, right? So let me just show a couple of clips to start off. Is it being shared? Society has rules. And the first rule is you go to college. Mm -hmm. You wanna have a happy and successful life? You go to college. If you want to be somebody, you go to college. If you want to fit in, you go to college. We have some really good news to bring you tonight. The once widely accepted mindset is being rejected. According to a New York new report from the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, undergraduate credential earners dropped by 1.6% last academic year, the largest drop in a decade was the equivalent of about 58,800 fewer people compared to the year before. Now, you might think, why are we celebrating this? Fewer people going to college and so forth. Well, two reasons. One, the cost of college has risen at five times the rate of inflation over the last 50 years. It's obscene. And it's often for things that don't really work in the real world. I was seeing so many people go to college and they were getting degrees that they weren't even using. A college degree hasn't pushed me any farther, so why do I want to put in all the money um, to get a piece of paper that really isn't going to help in what I'm doing right now? Now, it isn't just the runaway cost. Um, it's that these institutions have gone from kind of being, you know, liberal, kind of, you know, a little bit to the left, to actually engaging in acts of violence as an acceptable tactic against conservative speakers. Joining me now is the person who is being protested there, Charlie Kirk, founder and CEO of Turning Point USA, author of the college scam. Uh, given the reverberation, I can go to the next clip. They're not too important. 
Graduation season has ended and we won't be spoiling anyone's big day. Let's talk about what higher education in America really is. A racket that sells you a very expensive ticket to the upper middle class. <laughs> President Biden's American Families Plan asks the taxpayers to pony up hundreds of billions so that everyone can go to college and billions more for a subsidized childcare so our kids can go to school while we go to school. <laughs> the theory being that all this education trickles down and eventually gets to Florida. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, the right is calling Biden's plan social engineering, which is over the top, but Biden's plan is an endorsement of a particular idea that the more time humans spend in classrooms staring at blackboards, the better. Liberals see more school the way Republicans see tax cuts, as the answer to everything. We imagine going to college is the way to fight income inequality, but actually it does the reverse. If you have a bachelor's degree, you make about 65% more than someone who doesn't. And with a master's degree, it's more like 100% more. And the unemployment rate of college grads is about half what it is for high school grads. I know free college is a left-wing thing, but is it really liberal for someone who doesn't go to college and makes less money to pay for people who do go and make more? I'm asking. Especially since colleges have turned into giant luxury daycare centers with overpaid babysitters anxious to indulge every student whim. The University of Missouri has a river grotto inspired by the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> Texas Tech has one of the largest water parks in the country that includes a 25-person hot tub, tanning deck, water slide, and a lazy river. <laughs> a third of students now spend less than five hours a week studying. And when they do, it's for their onerous magnum cum bullshit course load of sports marketing, history through Twitter, <laughs> advanced racist spotting, intro to microaggressions, and you owe me an apology 101. Flavor of the wider political discussion over higher education that's occurring in society today. Um, on both the left and the right, as we just witnessed. And again, we're deeply concerned about it, and we think there's reasonable grounds to believe that basic academic standards are in decline uh, across the university system. Uh, what we decided to do was launch a survey. Uh, we sent it out uh, last summer. Uh, we got about 223, I'll talk about it in a moment, uh, respondents in the departments of mathematics, sociology, and English. And we'll be reporting the findings of that survey with regard to where um, professors, what they feel about these questions of great inflation and declining standards. Um, we're going to share some views that may be provocative. Uh, in the end, we do make the call. I guess Bill Maher would be disappointed. We make the call for public financing, a renewed civic commitment to higher education, uh, where universities were veritably free, uh, or at least collectively paid for in the post-war era. We'll make that progressive call, but en route to that, we're gonna be advocating staunch belief in the importance of maintaining merit, and that may indeed ruffle some feathers in the room, and I'll, I'll look forward in the Q&A about what people think. Okay, so undeserved grades or underserved students, faculty anxieties and declining standards in the corporate university, um, we think there are three semi-autonomous yet intersecting forces that are gradually undermining academic standards in higher ed and public trust in the signaling function of competence and grit that the college degree has traditionally conferred. We've come up with this kind of cheeky phrase, the broke, woke, stroke convergence, uh, because it's useful actually to capture just a massive amount of literature. Prior to carrying out any of these survey projects, uh, we like to read like tons and tons about the question at hand. And this, I think, nicely encapsulates the key themes that you'll encounter should you explore that literature. So broke, uh, this term refers to the most prevalent diagnosis of higher education's woes today. Severe revenue deficits as colleges compete to attract and retain students. State cutbacks in education since the 1980s and consequent steadily rising tuition have spurred increasingly unsustainable student debt, 
It's actually to the tune of just under $2 trillion right now, so it's no small number. With rising for-profit comp competitors and lower-cost online alternatives, universities have responded by deepening their commitment to business principles, i.e. corporatization. Associated trends include the rise in adjunct instruction and erosion of tenure, an amenities arms race to attract students. You just witnessed the big swimming pools. Uh, an increased evaluation, survival, or elimination of programs based on student enrollments. The anticipated demographic cliff and plunge in freshman enrollment by mid-decade may already be expediting these processes. So that's the broke component. Woke. This term captures a cultural trend, at least since the early 2000s. Tens of heightened awareness and advocacy around racial and gender injustices in society. In the higher ed context, the term is used as a pejorative by mostly conservative critics who denounce what they see as a radical campus climate inimical to the values of meritocracy, free speech, and colorblindness. Critics highlight institutions, uh, instances of cancel culture where speakers have been censored or professionally harmed for taking positions contrary to prevailing left-wing sentiment. Among such taboo positions is the minimization or denial of white supremacy, acknowledgement or pride in uniquely positive contributions of Western civilization, or the claim that racial ethnic disparities in educational or other outcomes can be attributed to group differences in culture, behavior, or ability. So that's the woke component. And this is the stroke component. This term loosely captures generational changes associated with the perception of heightened student entitlement and fragility. Here, faculty may feel compelled to, quote, stroke the egos of students they view as increasingly likely to push back for higher grades and others too vulnerable for stringent appraisals of their work. Associated cultural underpinnings include helicopter and overindulgent parenting, everyone's a winner, an accompanying victimization culture with emphases on microaggressions, trigger warnings, and safe spaces, a spirit of educational romanticism where all students are deemed capable of academic success with enough support provided, and a consumer ethos where good grades are expected as a return on students' financial investment, whatever their objective performance. So we have deep economic forces of broke, you know, corporatization that are at play here. They're intersecting with a woke cultural moment that goes back at least a decade, as well as a generational change, certainly linked to social media and other factors, rendering students more vulnerable than ever, and yet at the same time more entitled in terms of what they expect uh, for, for their student grades. We, uh, part of our motivation in launching this was perception that we had of increased student pushback. And more and more professors, it's just not worth it, just give them a good grade, just, you know, and the incentives in higher ed don't really reward us for being rigorous, and we'll, we'll elaborate on that. So the broke, woke, stroke convergence as an elective affinity, this is a, a phrase that the very famous sociologist Max Weber called from Goethe, and it's kind of fancy language here, but uh, elective affinities are historically contingent conjectures where partially autonomous Ideal and material forces mutually reinforce each other in socially consequential ways. So we don't see broke, woke, and stroke as, as uh, intending to do what they're doing. It's just they kind of emerged semi-autonomously and they, kind of, they symbiotically reinforce each other. The problem is that we don't see this triad of broke, woke, stroke forces fostering institutional incentives to uphold academic standards. There's no incentives really to uphold standards. In fact, we worry that it's cultivating a campus ethos outright antithetical to rigor. Uh, we need to stress probably the most important point, I underlined it here and I'll stress it again, uh, that our view is fundamentally structural and not agential. So what we mean by that is we're not looking at villains like, oh, the bloated administrator that's bent on exploiting adjuncts or the pampered professors you know, lowering standards to evade hard work. Uh, we, we don't see the problem in those personalistic terms. Uh, we see it really, we see the threat to standards today as a problem of incentives anchored in political economy and culture. So how is the broke, woke, stroke convergence eroding academic standards? Well, enrollment pressure, I just mentioned, the survival of the elimination of our programs based on student enrollments and graduation rates, rigorous grading or the failing of students becomes disincentivized. If our livelihoods as professors hinge on how many students enroll in our classes, why would we fail them? They might drift to another major, the university could cut your program, so it's, it's, a, it's essentially a perverse incentive built in to how universities work. Massification of higher ed. So increasing numbers of students that are ill-equipped or unprepared for the rigors of college-level work. There's a rich literature that we don't cite on 
and this happening in high schools around the country as well, where they're more or less just passing people through. I've talked to many, this is anecdotal, but I've talked to many high school teachers who tell me that they're not allowed really to fail students. If they don't show up, they get a 50. You get a 50 just to kind of start. So if this is happening really early, then it's happening in universities. We're deeply worried about where the principle of merit and excellence is, is uh, existing in our society and what this might bode for in the future. Um, c compassion for economically disadvantaged students, right? We just mentioned the $2 trillion debt burden. We face situations over the years where a student will come to us late in the game with kind of core skills deficits. What am I going to do, fail the student? And then they're going to figure out a way to take it with someone else that might be easier or have to pay another several thousand dollars to the university. Um, so many of us are just deeply compassionate, certainly during the uh, uh, COVID crisis as well, compassionate towards student challenges, another pressure that moves in the direction of not really taking standards seriously. Uh, the politicization of grading, this one's particularly sensitive. Uh, low grades or dropout rates for disadvantaged students, especially students of color, are often attributed today to systemic racism. In some cases, faculty may face professional repercussions for disparate grades by race, ethnicity, or too many Ds and Fs. And there's a statement that we quote in the paper, um, my, my co-writer, Anthony Hainer's alma, alma, alma mater for your BA, right, was at Brooklyn College. And they have a statement online where it basically says, it literally says, right, in their statement, faculty with too many Ds and Fs or with disparities by race in their grading need professional development. Um, so again, these cultural forces, these institutional forces seem to all be pushing in the same direction. And then finally, demand for positive teaching evaluations for tenure and promotion, the avoidance of student pushback that I just remember, that I just uh, mentioned, entitlement, this consumer model for good grades based on financial investment. I think any of these in isolation, and you might, if you look at it in isolation, you might think, well, no big deal, it's one, one thread, right? But when they all kind of come together in this broke, woke, stroke convergence, where the only incentive for rigor is faculty, in, in, you know, individual integrity, when all the incentives go the other way, uh, we worry that more and more students are getting, quote unquote, pushed through, or uh, very common for us to hear in conferences. Uh, Anthony likes to watch the higher ed uh, videos, uh, inside higher ed videos that they have at conferences. You'll hear, how do we get them through? How do we get them through? The emphasis more and more is on what we need to do to graduate students. Like the verb is on us, we graduate them. And the shift of culture has been slow, but it's pretty visible. Okay, so we wanted to do a big survey. I mentioned earlier, so uh, we surveyed 223 tenured professors at 40 large public universities in the United States in the Departments of English, Math, and Sociology. Pretty modest response rate. We actually had 74 faculty members enter the survey and not answer a single question. Some of the questions are sensitive. Um, actually, you know what? In case you were curious, I actually bought, brought some surveys and neglected to, neglected to hand them out. Say it again. Yes, the uh, yes, of course, yeah. The, the uh, we, I, we use Survey Monkey, and um, we, we didn't even allow ourselves to see the URLs. Completely anonymous. We employed the National Center for Education Statistics College College Navigator. We divided the country into four regions. Uh, we selected ten universities from each region, and our selection criteria was a public university with at least 10,000 enrolled students. The university would be average selectivity of a 50 to 80% acceptance rate and a common demographic profile, enrollment of no more than 80% white or another ethnicity. What we were going for was the closest we could to the quote unquote typical university experience in the United States. Um, you know, uh, there's private universities, but there's far more public ones. Far more students are enrolled in public universities than private universities. Uh, we're cognizant, of course, that our sample's just our sample, and we invite other researchers to explore in, in other sectors of the higher ed landscape. Okay, so here's the breakdown of our sample. Now, you'll notice that we add political orientation here, and that's quite relevant. I mentioned at the outset that um, my colleagues and I have been carrying out these academic surveys of, of professors regarding controversies within their fields. And what we find again and again when we carry out these surveys is that the best predictor of where a social scientist stands on some sensitive controversy in their field is their self-identified political orientation, right? So basically, if you know a professor's politics, 
you can already make a really good guess on where they're going to stand on some controversial issue in their field. So we kind of came into this survey with this hunch, I guess you would say. We weren't testing a hypothesis, but we had the hunch that politics may inform uh, where professors stand, and indeed it does, and as we'll show you in a moment. So the, the image of the screen, we can't see what's the topic. Uh, is that on that or? Oh, that, I'm sorry. The number of response on the column. Thank you, Bart. Um, and one thing that's really important to point out, um, I don't know if any of you have seen any of the, the data on the distribution by political orientation in universities today. Um, it, it, it is extraordinary. My field is about 40 to 1, liberal to conservative. I think communications was like 150 to, to 1. Um, even the fields you wouldn't expect, like chemistry, biology, liberal, overwhelmingly liberal. Down. I plead guilty. I'm on the left myself politically. I've always been that way. But we're concerned about it because we're concerned about an academic experience where pretty much everyone shares a certain political value system. It can create a kind of echo chamber effect. We'll talk about that as well. Okay, so what do we find? So these are just the highlights. Substantial fractions of the professoriate affirm the serious problems of grade inflation and eroding standards as well as their role in them. Or if you're missing anything there, okay, a little bit of, you can see it though. So 48% agree that grade inflation is a serious problem versus 21% who disagree. We mostly got pluralities, which means we got close to 50%, but no, no answer was over 50 or very few. Um, but you'll see that those who are concerned far outnumber those who aren't concerned about these things. 47% uh, agree that academic standards have declined versus 27% who disagree. Only 10% affirm that grade inflation reflects improvement in students' abilities or preparedness. Um, a grades were about 15% of grades in 1960. Today, they're closing in on 50%. And if you add Bs to that, I mean, the C is the new F, basically. And uh, so this is where the grade inflation is going. 37% admit to routinely inflating grades. So that's a pretty large number that just are open about it, even if it's anonymous. Many of us don't like to think we're doing something that is problematic in some way, right? 33% uh, admit to reducing the rigor of their courses over the years. 30% agree that they're demoralized participating in a declining standards credential mill. One of our questions used that very kind of polemical language because that's what we hear in the wider society. So we decided to ask how and get their reactions to that and we found that almost a third agreed with it. 23% uh, admit to sometimes feeling the four-year liberal arts degree is a grift. So lots of problems. Do they attribute it to the broke, woke, stroke convergence? Well, 79% agree that corporatization is a serious problem in higher ed versus only 8% who disagree. 49% affirm that encouraging a four-year degree to all has played a role in declining academic standards. 38% agree that too many students in university are not intellectually suited. That's a very sensitive question to ask. Uh, very often we talk in terms of preparation. Students aren't prepared. Here we're going for a tougher one. I'd, I invite some conversation about this at the end. Um, this idea that there is a genetic lottery and there's a distribution of intellectual ability, and that matters for student performance, is particularly sensitive among progressives. We kind of bristle at that. And yet we see that this overwhelmingly liberal faculty still feel, uh, a large number of them feel that too many are admitted who are not suited for the rigors, intellectually, for the rigors of college work. 40% uh, do not think that students are studying as much as they did in the past. 37% agree that student pushback has increased regarding grades. 59% affirm playing a more emotionally supportive, if not therapeutic, role with students over the years. That would suggest kind of emotional vulnerability that we're witnessing over the years. And 56% believe that student evaluation should not be used for tenure and promotion decisions. Uh, I had mentioned the importance of political identity a moment ago. And now what I'd like to draw your attention to is a kind of stairwell pattern that we see with regard to how political identity predicts where faculty stand on these sensitive questions that we're asking. So for example, 23% of radical professors, 13% of liberal professors, and 52% of moderates affirm that too many students are admitted to university who are not intellectually suited. Right, so you'll notice that where you stand politically 
is again, this really good predictor of what you're ultimately going to believe. And I should say that our options were radical, liberal, moderate, conservative, libertarian, and they self-identified. 31% of radicals, 44% of liberals, and 67% of moderates agree that encouraging a four-year degree to all students, whatever their ability or preparedness, has played some role in the erosion of standards in higher ed. 38% of radicals, 39% of liberals, and 71% of moderates agree that the watering down of courses in recent years is doing a disservice to more academically gifted students. 62% of radicals, 39% of liberals, and 11% of moderates affirm that due to differential treatment in college, marginalized students of color often have to perform stronger academically than more privileged students to earn the same grades. Something widely believed by radical sociologists, for example, and yet when you get to the moderates, you find much less credence. Um, the reason we don't have conservatives listed is because there virtually aren't any in higher education, which goes back to that initial point. Um, 66% of radicals, 54% of liberals, 20% of moderates agree that racial ethnic disparities and academic performance are due in no small part to systemic racism. And that's within universities. We're clear when we ask the question, within universities. 73% uh, of radicals, 51% of liberals, and 29% of moderates agree that virtually all students admitted with serious academic deficits can excel in a challenging curricular environment with sufficient academic and university support. And finally, 77% of radicals, 62% of liberals, and 33% of moderates affirm that standardized tests such as the SAT are culturally discriminatory, if not racist. So you're noticing that pattern each time, linear going up or down. So why is political orientation the best predictor of where faculty stand on these sensitive issues? Here I'm going to be integrating um, a, some information from a subfield of psychology called political psychology and where you're trying to examine what's going on. Why do people tend to gravitate to the left or right? And it turns out, I can't go too deep into it, although I welcome it in Q&A. It turns out people on the left and right actually emote differently. So if you're somebody who identifies either clearly on the left or clearly on the right, this might make more sense to you. It's harder if you're moderate. You might have a mix of those emotions. But it turns out emotions are not shared equally. And those emotions play a role in how we perceive the world and how we interpret evidence about the world. So the moral sensibilities that tend to animate the liberal left are strong feelings of care and fairness toward the vulnerable. The bleeding heart stereotype holds more than a kernel of truth. Contrary to the, however, contrary to the egalitarian protectiveness of the left, those further to the right tend to conform more readily to hierarchical relationships, relationships and resonate more with the sensibilities of order, certainty, and tough love. That tough love is common, right, um, on the political right. Political psychologists observe that conservatives tend to perceive a more dangerous world than liberals, where laggards or free riders should receive their just desserts, desserts lest they weaken the group. So again, different kinds of emotive sensibilities on the left and right. Liberal left intellectuals not only feel compassion for vulnerable groups, but often sacralize them in a way that hinders objective appraisals of their circumstances. Indeed, the left's instincts to protect the vulnerable manifest in narratives of marginalization, systemic racism, microaggressions, and more that insulate lower performing students from accountability for their outcomes. Note that the boundaries of these narratives are both intellectual and moral. Empirical claims that attribute responsibility to otherwise un underserved students or even acknowledge differences in their ability and effort are often policed out in campus discussion. The problem is exacerbated by the overwhelming predominance of liberals among the faculty ranks, which reinforces an echo chamber of shared assumptions, rarely interrogated or openly contested. Um, if, if I can just uh, indulge you with a, just a brief personal anecdote, I, I mentioned the sort of bleeding heart sensibility on the left and the tough love on the right. So it turns out my brother's pretty far on the political right and I'm pretty far on the political left and uh, his son, uh, my nephew took an EMT course one, one winter. So I'm on the phone with my brother. My brother says, uh, uh, yeah, Nikki, Nikki failed the EMT course. And I say to my brother, oh, God, the kid must be so embarrassed. I feel so terrible for him. And my brother goes, embarrassed? The course costs $2,000. Study harder. And I was like, hmm, that is another way of looking at it. But I, I give you that anecdote just to show when you have liberal left emotions, you're responding to information in the world it immediately triggers this kind of compassion impulse. And yet if you see the world as a different place, and it turns out political conservatives see the world as more dangerous, they're more attuned to fear in the environment around them, and they 
emphasize you got to be tough. You got to have resilience. Doesn't mean the left doesn't emphasize this, but the left tends to emphasize it less than the right. Okay, so liberal intellectuals' tendency to sacralize, marginalize students prompts emotive and, re and righteous responses. So we, we uh, distributed this survey and we definitely got some responses. We provided comment boxes under all of our questions and um, we can't generalize from these comments because they were optional. But what we did find is probably about a third of the responses to our survey were deeply hostile and about a third were rather celebratory and others were more just like commenting on something uh, scientific about the survey in one way or the other. Yes. To the questions. And sometimes toward us, actually, let's take a look at this one. Um, I'm writing to express my disappointment and frustration with your survey. In the spirit of collegiality and the expectation of unbiased sociological research, I began to take your survey. I stopped about halfway through because I found the questions to be biased and leading. I'm shocked they were approved by your IRB, it's your institutional review board. Terms like not intellectually suited, functionally illiterate, not prepared for college are euphemisms for students hailing from communities of color and lower socioeconomic classes. The phrasing of your questions betray your own views of the controversies facing higher ed. I would expect a much higher level of objectivity from a tenured professor in sociology from an institution such as Seton Hall. So um, I guess she told us what she really thinks. Um, too many students are admitted to university today who are not intellectually suited. So here's some of the comments. What kind of university? In the context of my university, I find the question pretty offensive. This right-wing talking point might just as well be rephrased to say, too many poor kids and students of color are admitted to university today who are threatening the hierarchy we want to preserve. Outrageously high, quote, standards reflect an elitist view of higher ed that has kept minoritized students, racial, ethnic, first gen, low SES, from climbing the social ladder. This way of thinking is a cancer on our society's moral character. The watering down of courses in recent years is doing a disservice to more academically gifted students. The premise of this question is repulsively elitist. I do not know what watering down of courses means. So-called academically gifted students have plenty of, quote, advanced opportunities for special learning in higher ed today. I recognize the statement as a code for a racist and possibly sexist meritocratic stance. There are still plenty of honors programs, advanced courses, and academic opportunities for students who are more academically accomplished. I don't accept the wording of this question, which displays bias. I'm stopping here. Okay, so we, I had mentioned that we do hold some beliefs that might ruff, ruffle feathers. Maybe they won't, but I invite uh, dialogue with this at the end of our talk. I'm kind of being a little silly here and suggesting you don't throw any tomatoes. Um, so we believe the increasing, that increasing numbers of ill-equipped students at university today in tandem with broke, woke, stroke forces are playing a role in the gradual erosion in academic standards. We do not believe that virtually all students admitted with serious academic deficits can flourish in a challenging curricular environment with enough university support. I should say, I want to believe that, but it's just not true in my view. Uh, we do not believe admissions tests are culturally discriminatory or racist. We believe admissions tests provide universities with another tool in addition to grades to predict student success. Hence, their elimination is not a positive development. Uh, I think that was one of our questions that did have a slight majority, actually. 51% believed it was a positive development. They had eliminated them in the school I was in. And did they reinstitute them? No, they're optional, right? Yeah, optional standardized tests. Uh, we do not believe the underrepresentation of minority faculty is due to often subtle processes of discrimination in the hiring and tenure process. We believe it's a pipeline issue. In other words, not getting enough uh, professors of color applying. We've been on search committees for 20, 30 years. Anthony, just a little bit longer. And, uh, and we're just starved. We're always trying to get minority candidates. The idea that there would be a bias against them is just it's absurd in our humble opinion, although I welcome discussion. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over for the last three slides for uh, Anthony. Thank you, Mark. Um, so we share a view of higher education akin to the most progressive of our respondents. First, there should be no test of intellectual suitability for admission to college. We believe in universal accessibility to higher education for all, pe uh, all people. Right? A university education is not a prize to be limited to a handful of lucky winners, but a resource which should be freely available to all. Right? 
85% of the respondents agree that the university's civic mission is as is at least as important as purveying job skills. 75% affirm that regardless of what the market values, we as a society should pay for four-year college for all. So this the importance of the civic mission of the university is certainly aff affirmed by us. Um, we wholly concur that this is how our university system should be. We should have publicly funded higher education as we had in the post-war decades, where places like Berkeley or CUNY were essentially free. I remember in my senior year at Brooklyn College, there were protests when a $53 student fee was uh, uh, instituted. Okay. But to build a political will for renewed public finance and a national commitment to higher, higher education requires coalition building across political lines. The broader public must buy in quite literally to not just the market value, but the civic value of a college degree. Um, we cannot make that case by eroding standards or diminishing the traditional values of hard work and merit. I think as the clips that you saw at the beginning that Mark showed, I, I think on both left and right, the legitimacy of higher education is being questioned. So we need to build that consensus across ideological lines for its importance, not only as a purveyor of job skills, but um, as basically what training people to be better citizens and participants in, in the political culture of the society. Right, so as just stated, we, uh, not, uh, right, so nothing seems less realistic today than a return to a re renewed public commitment and investment in higher education. The public is sharply divided politically um, with trust in our major institutions, including higher education at record lows. So I think what we're trying to forge or see forged in our society is on the one hand, a greater public support for higher education at the same time, um, maintaining rigor and upholding standards. That's sort of the deal, the covenant <laughs> that we would like to um, help build. Um, we suggest that in our limited sphere as faculty, we can work to rebuild trust in higher education. Uh, now, so I think there are values that um, uh, to which we can all um, commit ourselves as being important, as being relevant. Um, one, I don't think anybody would say we want our institutions of higher education to go bankrupt. So solvency is important. All right, that's a value to which Broke refers. Equity um, for marginalized and protected groups. Most of us, right, certainly progressives, but m many people in the society would say that's a, a worthwhile um, value. Right. And compassion, compassion for the emotional and financial vulnerabilities of students. Right, we don't like. Right, we would we we would like to minimize the degree to which our students feel deep anxiety. All right, so we we are compassionate for their emotional and financial vulnerabilities. Problem is that those three values, as important and as legitimate as they are, are working against a fourth, which is merit, which is a commitment to excellence. And this relates to the college degrees signaling function uh, of student competence and, and grit. So I, I think we, where we, um, what we are saying is that there's a tension, a, a very real tension between broke 
woke stroke values and this fourth value, a commitment to merit and excellence. The way forward is to acknowledge that our economic interests right, in plump program enrollments and happy student consumers and our values, compassion, equity, solvency, right, are spurring grade inflation and a likely erosion in academic standards. We need to acknowledge that these values are prompting us to take some implausible positions um, and others that are out of step with the wider public. For example, uh, the alleged impact of faculty biases on minority student performance, educational romanticism, one-sided endorsement of affirmative action, rejection of standardized tests. So, uh, to some degree, the position that we hold is pushing against or challenging uh, deeply held uh, positions. But um, on the other hand, I think um, there is a, an uneasiness, not only among the faculty, but within the wider public, that somehow um, uh, a college degree is losing its legitimacy, and um, and that needs to be addressed. So I think we're in line with those currents of thought that are out there in the culture as well. To address these problems, we endorse an additional value in our hiring practices, viewpoint diversity, the paucity of politically moderate faculty and near absence of conservatives exacerbates our tendency as liberal professors to privilege woke stroke sensibilities over the traditional values of hard work and merit. This is not a strategy to gain the trust of politically moderate and conservative publics whom we need to build a political will for renewed public investment in higher ed and a shift away from student debt, the, the student debt finance regime. I guess the argument is that if there were more moderates and conservatives on the faculty, we would have a more robust debate <laughs> regarding the tension that exists between merit on the one hand and um, uh, these other values, equity, uh, compassion on the other hand. So I think I'll, right. I'll just, add just a, another right. anecdote. Um, to raise concerns that most of the public has, um, like right now the Supreme Court's about to vote on affirmative action. Uh, it's likely going to substantially erode affirmative action, if not eliminate it. Colleges will have some way to work around it. But it's not so much I'm, I'm here to say we should support either side, but we should have all sides in university discussions, and they're not. And if someone were to raise in a university setting a position in alignment with large numbers of people in the public, even California voted against it back in the 90s, um, they would be shamed quite substantially because you're, you're, you're not reflecting this kind of vulnerability and sensitivity that is more uh, associated with left liberal moral sensibilities. So we're getting further and further skewed away from where the public is at precisely the time that we need to just invest in higher ed as a civic good. But what, when you have this shaming by overwhelmingly left liberal professors of conservative professors, you're not building political will. You're not making it realistic. You might feel good. You know, I'm, I'm the superhero for the vulnerable, and you're not. Shame on you. But how does that get them to work with you toward making hard decisions? Uh, I alluded in the very beginning of the talk that there may indeed be some concerns in our economy that are structural. Uh, I'm, I'm open to ideas, and this is becoming widespread in discussion today, that where we're going with artificial intelligence, 3D printing, self-driving vehicles, um, we're going to a space where we may not need workers increasingly over time. And if we continue to define higher education solely as a job, a skill transfer, and we neglect its vital civic role, we're in for some real political troubles um, down the road that might make the Trump phenomenon you know, uh, I look rather mild. So uh, my political motivation for what it's worth, just to end on that note, is to bring people together, so is Anthony's, so that we can invest in higher education as a civic good, cultivate the best in our people, 
so that when we respond to whether the structural, maybe the environmental with climate change, we respond to these things in a healthier way as opposed to the kind of toxic civic culture that we witness politically in the media. So I'll end it there, and Anthony, I don't know if you want to come up. We can field questions or however we want to do that. Yes? What's that? One minute. One minute. Oh, she's got, he's got a microphone for you. Thanks. I, too, went to Brooklyn College prior to open enrollment and was there when open enrollment started. And I was actually talking to President Neller. I was in his office when there were thousands of students yelling, Yell, Neller, you liar, we set your ass on fire. And these kids, like what happened is when you and I went to Brooklyn College, it was one of the highest rated schools in the country. Now it's a third tier school. And I think that open enrollment has weakened the status of City University in terms of the desirability of very bright students wanting to go there. My kids wouldn't even look at it. They felt, they, they thought it was just all over the place that anybody can get in, that there are debates even so far as to having prerequisites. When I was taking symbolic logic, I did not want kids who didn't have deductive logic. And I think that there has to be, when you go to, first of all, everybody's not suited to go to college. Not everybody wants to go to college. There are vocational schools that are suited for many, many people. And one of my kids shouldn't have gone to college. She should have traveled for a couple of years until she learned the value of money and then maybe gone to college. She went to NYU. But what I'm saying is, is that I think that there's too much tolerance in schools for people who are not academically suited for being there. And call me a snob, call me right wing if you want. I mean, I, I, I'm a registered Democrat, but, but I have, I think that there's a difference between compassion for people and, and watering down our education. Let, let me ask you, and I'll, I'll raise this question to everyone, but do you think in general, greater accessibility to higher ed tends to reduce standards? All right. All right. All right. How to, if people didn't know how to conjugate verbs properly, if they couldn't write a structured paragraph, if they couldn't do the kind, like elementary mathematics, you shouldn't have remedial math and remedial English in college. That, if you can't master certain basics, then why would you even want to go? And then, and then you tend to, um, what's the word? You're, you're not challenging the able students at the top also with greater accessibility, right? And so they then seek out the schools, right, where they, seek, they will they be more transparent. Right. Yes. Right. That's sort of, we don't, does everybody agree with that? I don't know. We don't, I, I would say, this is the first time raising this between us, so it's kind of ironic, but I would say accessibility doesn't have to lower standards if we as professors can actually grade students like appropriately, but we can't. So there's so much pressure on us to, push students through, that it doesn't enable us. And let me go back to the deeper point about our call, our rather quixotic, I don't think you can see it from the last slide, our quixotic call for public financing. A public finance regime would enable that because we, we would know that we could tell a student that they don't have the requisite skills and it's not going to saddle them with tens of thousands of dollars in debt. You know, So this is in everybody's interest for us to collectively pay for this. Um, and I, we could start renewing our commitment to honors programs which are under attack now, they're getting dismantled. Um, again, there's this deep egalitarianism, which I emotionally share, but it's leading to, I think, policy outcomes for our head that don't serve our, our country as a whole. So, so one thing, I, uh, I think it's important, and it not, it's, not the, it's not something that we can really blame on universities, but a major factor is just the job market in general, people talk about a lot that jobs that used to just require a high school diploma, a lot of those now require a bachelor's or a master's now. So there's a lot of talk about uh, like, you know, accessibility and, and students that are in college who aren't, uh, you know, intellectually up for it. In a lot of cases, they're there because they have to, because if you, increasingly, if you don't, there, there are just no opportunities for people who don't go to college. So many people are basically being forced to it. So, so 
again, I don't know how we how we solve that issue, but uh, this is changing now. Like Governor Hogan in Maryland, and recently Governor Murphy in New Jersey, are making um, uh, people with high school uh, degrees eligible for certain state jobs, which previously were only open to those with college degrees. I don't know how you feel about that, but there seems to be a trend in that direction so, to not require. Yeah, and some, some might education. advocate that. The whole thing worries me. You know, both positions worry me a great deal. And again, it's this presumption that many have that the only point of going to college is to get a job. And the kinds of social problems, I don't mean to be apocalyptic, but the kinds of social problems that are quite realistically coming down the pike, environmental and uh, economic, are going to require a lot of cooperation. And when I look at our political culture, I don't see much cooperation. So higher ed as a, as a space for people to be critically growing and cultivating their humanism and humanity uh, needs to be part of the conversation as well. But it can't be at this price tag. It's not realistic. I agree with your, the spirit of your question. It's not realistic for a lot of I mean, people. I mean, it's also if there are, because part of it is also that schools have been, it's like, it costs so much because schools have been able to increase their tuition so much yes. because everyone has to go to college. So they, it's kind of a captive audience that they have. If there are more alternatives, if, there, if people have other ways where they can uh, get a respectable career and make a good living off of that, then the school wouldn't be able to you know, charge so much of a, a premium for something if it's no longer quite so Yeah, and if so they're investing mandatory. in these swimming pools and they're investing in these massive bureaucracies to compete to get students, again, this is a kind of market model of higher ed, it just drives up costs incessantly. Yeah, and then there are some countries that ha institute a more or less uh, tracking system at earlier ages. And I know we've tended in the U.S. to resist that strategy to say, well, based on your test results at the age of 12 or whatever, we're going to put you on a vocational track. Or, um, other countries se seem to bend more in that direction. So I don't, I don't know how you feel about that, the idea of tracking. Or... Yeah, that was actually going to be my question. Oh. It was related to these uh, trade schools, um, you know, machinist, sheet metal working, plumbing, electrician, et cetera. Um, because in certain areas of the country, there's a, you know, there's a dearth of these uh, jobs, not jobs, but um, applicants. They need people. So but in terms of equity, would you be advocating then for not just universal funding of higher ed, but also universal funding of just these trade schools in general, many of which require associate's degree, um, you know, two-year degree? Um, and then if so, then where is the funding going to be coming from for all of this? How do we fund this, which is always the political question? It's the toughest question of all. I mean, I more than making an argument, I increasingly realize what we're doing, trying to build trust. The arguments are up here. Trust is like on the ground with people. And we're not building trust. Uh, there's so many problems implicated in the, in the funding question, the way the media works. The media is organized around money and how many people watch it. Human nature, going back to political psychology as such, that we feel good in our tribes. So people on the right filter their way into Fox News and they're watching it and they're hearing about how horrible Democrats are. People on the left are finding themselves watching MSNBC or their own independent left-wing web pages to hear how horrible and evil the Republicans are. So these are deep systemic problems with the way our economy is organized. So the challenge of getting us to where you know, we could be in a space where it could be realistic, because it's easy for me to say, oh yeah, we support it for, for vocational, which we do, but we're just infinitely far where we need to be in our civic culture. So we see us, maybe we're screaming in the wind and it's hopeless, but we see us as just kind of moving this conversation in this direction toward greater receptivity with people with whom we disagree. It's why we want more moderates and more conservatives, frankly, in higher ed with us so we can build trust across ideological lines. But yes, we do support that. Uh, regarding standardized tests, uh, wasn't there, I'm trying to remember the details. I'm probably going to get the details wrong here. Wasn't there a, like Stuyvesant High School or some high school in New York City, didn't they say uh then they institute admission based on test scores or or ed, or uh, to standardized tests or something like that and what ended up happening is the student body became mostly asian and people were horrified at the ethnic disbalance 
Do you know more about that? Um, so there's specialized high schools in New York, and basically they only look at the SHSIT, which is a standardized test, and you only take it once, and that's the only thing they look at. Like, they don't look at your grades, they don't look at anything else, just your score on that. And I don't know about the Asian part, but I do know about that, because I'm taking that next year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're raising implicitly a, a very sensitive question, the, the question of ethnicity and race. And this certainly happened in the history of Harvard, Go early in the 20th century, Jews were excluded from Harvard. Now there's this concern that if they were really genuinely committed solely to academic standards as the principle of entrance, there'd be an overwhelmingly disproportionate number of Asians, smaller number of whites, and virtually no black and brown people. And what, what happens when that outcome occurs is that deeply compassionate people, like probably everybody in this room, we want to kind of figure it out and go, what well, has to be the test? And it's very painful to think that it may not be the test. Like what is going on in black and brown communities where their kids are not competing at the same level in school? We're, as sociologists, we tend to see this as deeply structural, rooted in upstream factors that affect students way before they enter the university gates. And our fear is that instead of addressing those political problems that are upstream, we're looking at higher ed and saying, well, we'll just continue to just water down and erode our standards as the solution so that we can meet certain kinds of multicultural objectives that aren't in the long run interest of maintaining a high rigor in university. So that's the concern. Yes. Uh, I actually had a question similar to his. So I've heard that, so in colleges, they want diversity, right? So I've heard they uh, tend to accept people, I don't know how to explain it. It's like they reject some people who might have more academic merit than others because say they're Asian. Well, of course. Yeah, because they want to have a certain amount of each race to remain diverse. So they reject some people with more academic merit than others. What do you think that, about that? that? Well, it's, are you asking if it's true? Yeah, it's definitely true. It's what the Harvard, the Supreme Court case is dealing with right now. It's a group of Asian students that came together. There's also one in North Carolina. And uh, so it's definitely true. If you're interested in that, there's a fairly accessible book by, um, I don't know if he's a political scientist or sociologist, Richard Sander wrote a book called Mismatch. And he just, he got the data from California on this. And I don't have the exact numbers in my head, but it's, if you're like a black student, you can get in 200 points lower than a white student. Um, and yeah, so it just, it fits that pattern. And it, it's starting to shift the political equation a little bit. Uh, there may be a shift politically now of Asian populations toward the right, which they have traditionally been democratic strongholds. So again, this merit question is with us. I don't think we can avoid it. And it forces some really sensitive conversations like this one. Just two quick, very quick comments. One, there are institutions like Amherst who have taken bold steps to increase the proportion of students who are black and Latino. And it's, it's sort of, it, sound, it looks like sort of a quota system. But the, the other point I wanted to make, there's a lot of grade inflation going on at the high school level. Right? So that when people apply to these top schools, they get an incredible number with, I, I think you could have a GPA over four, don't they have like yeah. eight plus? So you have these incredibly high, large numbers of students with incredibly high GPAs, and then the SATs are optional. So they're trying to say, okay, we have like so many applicants with the same very, very high GPA, how, on what basis are we going to make admission decisions? And I think um, equity might be one way to go there to say, well, let's get a decent, uh, you know, a, a representation of various groups. For, for, right, cons so. for conservative critics right, so of what's going on, um, so. I mentioned Richard Sander, he's a liberal, but many, many conservative critics will point to what, to the mismatch as something where the affirmative action actually doesn't benefit anyone because then you're getting black and brown students in schools they, they they're struggling when they get there and and so and then they end up on the bottom often of their classes and then there's a lot of frustration and resentment connected to that and that's a political you know firestorm results from that there've been some notorious cases that we can we can go into if you're curious i think she wanted to follow up with something brief yes Uh, you can have, I think, your unweighted average has to be under, your unweighted GPA has to be under four, but your weighted GPA, I think, can be over four. I don't know, though, because that's a high school thing in school. I think if you're, sorry, 
believe that if you're in honors or AP, you get a bump. Yeah, I think right. so. So that, that could explain some of that, right? Uh, I had one other th thought from uh, a separate topic. The, the thing you mentioned about viewpoint diversity in uh, in higher education it just uh, it was something that I thought was so, so there's probably some like, yeah, like excessive knee jerk reactions on the on the left, but a lot of mainstream conservative viewpoints or, or positions are increasing kind of anti science, anti inquiry. So it's i mean it, it it just seems kind of kind of odd for like a political party to to stake out those kind of positions that are kind of like the opposite of you know you know being so anti inquiry is the opposite of what university education is about and then they complain that no conservatives want to be university professors it's i don't know if you have any thoughts on that but it's just kind of a I have a lot of yeah, no, um, what's interesting about that is that each political side will point to different kinds of information as junk science. So the political right will talk about like gender issues, for example. All these things are being pushed by the left. They'll claim it's based on junk science, right? Um, and obviously difficult, sensitive issues linked to uh, a trans identity going on in society today as well. And then the, the political left will critique much going on the political right, denial of climate change by the most dramatic example of that, right? I, I do think there's still a very large number of people who would go into university and maybe become professors if they didn't feel it was a climate hostile to them. Um, so we should do what we can. And there's a debate in the literature on why there's so few conservatives, because the numbers were not anywhere near as dramatic post-war. I mean, they just continue to get more and more skewed. I don't think there's any, virtually any in, in social science now that are that are conservative, maybe an occasional moderate. Um, so the debate is whether they're being consciously excluded in search committees or whether they're, they're uh, selecting themselves out due to an inhospitable climate. I think the answer is both are happening. Um, I, I incline toward believing it's more selection pressures, although I have been on search committees in full disclosure where it's pretty clear that the conservative candidate didn't have a shot um, because people treat the knowledge claims not just as empirical claims but as deeply moral claims, right? So on, on the issue of race, for example, there's a sensitive controversy about whether culture matters, right, with certain communities. Like, are they studying as much? See how sensitive that is? Like, what are you saying? It's our fault? You're blaming the victim? And then if you're an academic who believes culture matters, and you say, you know, black community, the brown communities, they just have to work hard, you know, and if they acted like the, you know, the stereotype of the model minority Asians, they would be succeeding. If you were to articulate that in a faculty meeting, I mean, good luck, especially if you don't have tenure. It'd be, it'd be, and I'm not saying it because I endorse that view. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm saying it because we have to have a healthy and vibrant discussion of very sensitive topics, and we're not having it, and we're deeply polarized, and we're not, we have, we're just trying to move us toward unity on this. I think she might have beat you, or Bart hasn't. Had Actually, I have the microphone. <laughs> Woohoo! So, um, Freddie DeVore was here a couple of months ago, and one of the things that he was saying was that, uh, first of all, there's the ultimate outcome of uh, advanced education is uh, increasingly filtering the, um, the, the elite into, um, into positions of, of power and-, uh, and like the, the naturally economy. gifted. Yeah, basically. He's talking about ability hierarchy. Yeah. Well, basically, he's, he's really talking about those who are able to get through the university system tend to be uh, white, upper class, et cetera, et cetera, and that over the, because, Fewer people actually exit the system um, who don't have those characteristics. It absolutely winds up. This is his point. Winds up further stratifying uh, the country in terms of their wealth um, and power and, and influence and that sort of thing. Um, and so it does kind of leave me wondering if there is a reduced need for people to do things to work. Um, and the, uh, what does that then say about the need for higher education? And are there things about higher education that ought to be undocked from training, for instance, right? So, I mean, I, I took a lot of classes that I really am glad I took, 
they really didn't have much application to many of the things that I later was asked to do. Um, but where's the value then, right? Especially when you're talking about a very expensive proposition, if you undock it from this will help you get a good job, what then happens and, and why would we need grades anymore? Yeah, no, it, definitely a good point. Um, if we had a civically funded collective system, all of that could in principle go away, especially if jobs continue to disappear. I mean, I'm not disappearing tomorrow. And there've been many people who make this prognostication over the years and capitalism has seen to produce jobs again and again. Just incidentally, I, I carried out a survey in 2018 of economists on this very question and overwhelming. It's one of the few areas where economists are united except for the far left ones. The far left ones believe that systemic unemployment is around the corner. The rest are optimistic that there will always be more and more jobs. It's so hard to disentangle, to figure out something. It's hard enough to understand what's going on in the world, never mind some kind of futuristic vision of where the economy is going, right? Um, I lean toward believing this is a systemic problem that will eventually, maybe not now, maybe not next decade, maybe two decades, start to become increasingly severe. So laying the groundwork for a university that's collectively funded would enable us to not give grades. We could give feedback that's honest, though, you know, and we wouldn't have to skew priorities the way we're doing it now. Just, just one quick, one quick cop. I'm struck by, and I think it's very uh, upsetting to those of us who t teach in higher education. I'm struck by, pardon the use of this term, but how people regard higher education as bullshit, basically, right? So. So the, 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 the right critique represented by Ingram and others, I think tends to be along the lines, well, it's bullshit because it's, it's ideological, right? It's brainwashing. So, but then there are other things like, I don't know what Mars reaction, why would he, why is he exactly, we uh, say it's bullshit. I think one thing he would say is that there really isn't free inquiry. Right, so many people on the left are recognize, well, it's, it's not really, it's not conforming to the model of the university as a place where different, you could have debates, discussions, conversations, engage each other. So I think Mars saying that's, that's really not happening. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm just struck by that characterization of higher education as bullshit and then therefore not worth it. All right, so. Okay. One thing that I would feel more comfortable with, rather than having a quota system or saying we want X number of different kinds of groups, would be if there were funds that were raised or earmarked for people who couldn't get in under the requirements that universities have, who which would enable people from different groups who aren't well represented to go that were separately funded so that it wouldn't take, in other words, so that if somebody who has a, one, a good GPA and did well on the SATs would not be displaced by somebody who didn't do as well but was disadvantaged. In other words, if, if they kept the same requirements but maybe added a certain number that was earmarked for the school that was set, that was privately funded, then you wouldn't be taking anything away from anyone and you would just be adding to the student body. And I, I wonder what you think, because to me that seems fair. Yeah, it, it seems like consistent with how daunting we see even our quixotic call for overall public funding. It's still gonna require money, it's gonna require an investment, it's gonna require people coming together and sharing that vision to expand higher ed for people who otherwise not have access to it at the same level. Uh, uh, here I am advocating this, and I'm quite honestly rather pessimistic. Yeah. Oh, I don't know just, just, just very one, one quick response to that is that we do support a robust academic support, student support system, but then, but not, but we still believe it's important to uphold standards ultimately. So we should support students with deficits who are motivated, those with potential. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, we don't want to get to the point where rigor is um, compromised. So, I, don't know, like I remember that woman at the conference. Right. Common today, if a student gets like a bad grade, we have an entire infrastructure now 
like in higher ed. So success teams. massive success teams will be alerted and, and people will be contacting them. And I'm not here to be this arch conservative or anything. It's taken, you know, like I said, my whole life I've been on the left. But it's like, I didn't have any of that. And I'm not saying it should be sink or swim, but, it, you know, um, even though we do strongly support us uh, uh, having access to these things and having the support they need, the case could be made that it's uh, bent a bit too far. Yes. Um, so I support the, you know, state funding of higher ed and trade school education. Um, but, you know, I've seen studies that say, um, you know, that, that show and demonstrate that even students who go to college and may not be well prepared, who complete like a couple years or even three, you know, two to three years of college, um, they end up faring better in the job market. Um, so maybe they weren't intellectually suited for higher education, but yet they still got a benefit and they still would, you know, found a better career and are making uh, more money on average than they would have. Um, what would you say to, I mean, again, if this is true, what would you say to some, some study like that who are advocating for the universal, you know, access to higher ed and, you know, more of the open enrollment model? But are you suggesting it's a contradiction? I'm not following exactly. Yeah, because there's a benefit even if people aren't prepared for college and they're not suited for college, but by going to college, there's a societal good that is met because they have higher performance afterwards and higher income um, just by the experience of going to college, which would go against sort of this, you know, idea that, oh, well, too many people are ill-prepared going to college. You I mean, maybe we should, you know, you know, you know, tighten the spigot. Yeah, well, I... Our argument is, of course, the opposite. We don't want to tighten this bigot. We want anyone to be able to access it. And if they come to college, they're not mired in an infinity of debt if they do. So they can come to college, and I, as a professor, can grade them like I think they should be graded. And again, that sounds harsh, but there's a tendency among progressives, I know, because I've been one for you know my whole life. We don't want to even believe there's an... A, It happens. Yeah, yeah, they could leave early, but we still have to be honest about where the skill sets are. And some people have, and I agree with you, Greg, that uh, people can shine in college. One of the points, I don't know if I'm stealing your thunder, because you, you, you often comment on this issue of targeting people younger. You want to comment on that or no? You know where I'm going? Right. It, yeah, we, we, right. we strongly advocate finding students of all walks of life and you know, giving them opportunities so we can find, but again, you have to believe in the idea that intellectual ability exists. There's a genetic lottery and we want to make sure those students who are very, you know, the right side of that tail, who are really, really capable are not hindered by life circumstances, poverty, or other things that would hinder their access to being able to, to shine academically. So programs like that, we strongly endorse. If you want to. All right. So I, I did my, uh, graduate work at Rutgers, and they have a program called the Rutgers Scholars Program. Beginning in the seventh grade, certain students are identified, and then if they, can, if they show continued promise and high levels of achievement, then they get a free education at, at Rutgers. So that, that, that program begins in the seventh grade, trying to identify a certain number of students from each school. and. Uh, so that's sort of along the lines that, that yeah. maybe you're... We, we support it, but the ethos seems to be inimical to it right now because that's about targeting the really like capable student, the most capable, and then giving them rewards. The ethos tends to be the opposite, right? Uh, that's seen as elitist to approach it that way. Yes, exactly. Kind of following on your point, um, the... Um, okay, if you take a look at something, let's say China, Right, they think of colleges as uh, producing a product for business, and I I don't get the impression in America that we really do that. That I don't even know that colleges even track what their student uh, graduates do and or get feedback from business on whether their product is is doing well or not. Uh, I my impression of colleges is that they tend to want to appeal their programs to what uh, young people will spend money to go see in college. So it's, in other words, they're cultivating their business to make money, but they're not really producing the merit 
at the employment end after college. And I think that in America, there ought to be a better balance of, of people graduating from colleges that are uh, more capable of going right into a, a career. Because my impression is that the feedback I see is that businesses can't get enough qualified people for jobs. I, I have things, to, but did you want to address this point? I'm sorry. Okay. I, I kind of, some of that is, I feel like is kind of the business fault because some businesses, they basically want, businesses don't train employees anymore uh, to an increasing extent. So the, the company saying that they aren't able to find qualified employees, I, I think it's because what they consider qualified is possibly they're setting too high of a bar. They're looking for someone who will just go in and already know everything there is to know about the, the thing day one so they don't have to train them at all. I think that some companies' expectations are increasingly uh, unrealistic in that regard. Uh, might get an interesting debate just, here. Just, <laughs> no, I mean, just take the example of programming, programmers. The demand is through the roof. The supply is just not there. And we have zillions of people coming in from India and China and wherever because those places have been routing people to that very practical outcome. And so when companies can't find uh, students out of American colleges to su satisfy that, yeah, they're, they're trying to bring in people from wherever. So I'm just saying the practicality model is not there in college. And I think it, it would be far better than, it sounds like an awful lot of uh, you know, touchy-feely concepts that are being discussed as opposed to jobs. Well, if it's true what you're saying, and I'm not sure, I'm not denying it either, I don't know where to stand between you two, um, but if it is true, it strikes us that the forces that we dis we identifying here are, are the culprits. Like you have this corporatization model where it's all about just getting as many people as possible. Another big buzzword in colleges today, it's retention, retention. I'm, I'm in favor of retention, please, I'm not a monster. Uh, but it's just so prioritized. I don't think, do we even hear lip service to standards in higher ed today? Yeah. I don't. I don't even hear it mentioned much. It used to in the old days, they'd at least say. Uh, nowadays, it's retain and support and all those sorts of things, plus the sensitivity that we have in the culture. You know, the broke, woke, stroke forces seem to be at play here. I would caution too much confidence, though, that this commitment to investing in all of this tailored to the market is the way to go. Um, you know, uh, Bart had mentioned Freddie DeBoer being here a couple months ago. I mean, his point is that what happens is it gets saturated. He mentioned the example of pharmacy, and then you have massive numbers of people with a degree which they can't find work. If indeed there are structural problems with capitalism, and I think there's a decent chance there is, um, that narrowing of the discussion to just skills transfer is really problematic. I, I know it can sound, what was the phrase you used? I liked it. Uh, touchy-feely. I, I know it can sound touchy-feely to stress the civic side of it, but I actually, not to be apocalyptic, I see it as like life or death. We have got to build collective trust. We have to build civic engagement, civic competency, a decline in the tendency to demonize the other, uh, because we're going to need to respond to some very real challenges down the road, and our public, our civic culture is so destructive right now, and the levels of distrust are off the charts. All major institutions, academia is not alone in this. Even the police, which historically have been high status in terms of the, not status, high trust in the public are in decline in the, in, in the context of uh, current developments. So yeah, a lot's going on. Uh, I think both civic and market values need to be brought together. This might be anathema to you, but when I went to school, when I went to college, I never once thought I was going to college to make a better living when I got out of it. I went because I like to learn. And I don't have any friends who went to college when I was younger. Now it's different. Now it seems to be different. But when I went to college, they they just started teaching computer programming as I was graduating. They did not, it was not a major. Most of the people were humanities majors, and humanities usually didn't lead to a great job. It it was more more cultural literacy was important. And I think that we're missing that. And 
you know, I, I remember telling my kids, if you're not interested in learning, if you're not academically oriented, there are other, like my husband was a builder, you don't need to go to college for that. There, are, I challenge property assessments, you don't need to go to college for that. I made a great living. There are jobs that you can do without going to college where you could make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and we both did. I went to college, he, grad he dropped out, he wasn't interested. Bottom line is, I really think that we're losing the focus of how important education is as a good in and of itself, as Kant would say. I was Kantian when I was growing up. And I, I really, I loved it. And I didn't hear any of the joy of learning in your discussion. It was more academically oriented or what kids are gonna get when they get out. But where is the process of learning in your ideas. Part of an important shift in the zeitgeist of higher education is this idea that if students are not interested in the subject matter, that it's the professor's fault, right? So there's a strong emphasis on engagement, um, pedagogy, use of technology. Like So I... I um, Right, learning's different. You have to tap into the student's learning style. All right, so I observe many classes. I, I, not only my own classes, but other classes. I, I don't know if this is going to shock you, but there's a significant percentage of students who during the class are on other websites. Like they're just not, they're totally not focused on what's going on. So, but but the... What we are led to believe, right, by the by the educate higher ed establishment or whatever, is that that that's our fault. I don't I don't think anyone needed to engage you, right? So you were already engaged. So I think we now if people if students are not engaged, then we need to think about maybe alternatives. Maybe those courses aren't a good fit, and they need to be. They need to pivot to something else. I think we need to have honest conversations about this, not just push people through. Right? So, yeah, no, and, 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 and actually, you're making such a great point. Yeah. Um, often we talk almost as if we think audiences can hear our minds or something. I cannot agree with you more. And I, I was like that too. I just, I still am. Just want to learn about the world. Deep, deep passion. I don't know if it's something that we can teach. We can embody it. But at the end of the day, there's so many larger structural and cultural forces creating the situation Anthony just highlighted that are outside of our control. All we can do is our best to inspire students. I, I, in recent years, though, it's happening more and more. And I, we should stress, we're not beating up our, our university. Our surveys about public universities, we see this as a systemic problem universities face across the country. But more and more, my normal enthusiasm in the classroom is being met with, I don't know, nonchalant disengagement. Maybe the, maybe the uh, COVID was more significant. Then, you know, in, in terms of maybe there's just like a hiccup in the culture due to that. I don't know, but it is disturbing me that people do not share the value system that I think you, you brought to bear, the, cur the deep curiosity that you brought to bear in your experience in college. College degree tend to do like, tend to get higher paying jobs or like tend to get jobs. Why do you think that is? Because they have the college degree or because of what they learn from college? And I think there's another, I think yes and yes, and I'm going to add a third yes. <laughs> yes and yes and a third yes. I, I believe in a distribution of ability. And the people who go to college more often are those that can actually handle the rigors of college. So they're also bringing their skill set with them when they leave college, to, which might even be more important. I mean, if I, I, I don't mean to sound such like a hardcore IQ determinist, but if you took somebody with 120 IQ who never went to college versus someone with an 80 IQ who did, I'm thinking the one with 120 would be able to navigate the job market more successfully, right? So I think all of those things in their intersection play a role in, in, in success after college, financial success. I think it's important oh. as you evolve. It's fine with us? Yeah. Um, yes. But, sorry, I don't know if it's like entirely relevant, but say... So if I go to Columbia University, then I'm probably more likely to get a job than if I go to like, I don't know, California State University, I don't, that was random. <laughs> then do you really think like the education in say Columbia or Harvard is so much better no. than? 
Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I think it's just the <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and education at the end of the day, and this is the biggest cliche in the world, but fundamentally true. Some of the cliches are true. It's what you make of it, how much you're committing your energy to growth and learning. And you can learn that in any state school, right? So I think what you're hitting on is the fact that these are elite institutions with networks and alumni and job connections and all of that's why I said yes and yes to you. All of it matters. The independent learning that's greater at Harvard versus a state school, probably some, but it's not very, it's not very significant in my view. I don't know, Anthony, if you have a different take. No, that's, uh, don't go to college. Just, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's interesting, now what's interesting yeah. is that Bill Maher went to Cornell and then, right? And then he's his, slamming college. Right, and he's slamming uh, even elite institutions for... Well, thank you guys very much. You were a lively, lively crowd. <laughs> thank you, Mark and Anthony, uh, for, again, uh, speaking. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, as uh, usual, um, those who want to continue the conversation, we are going to be heading out to dinner um, somewhere. Um, we, we'll all meet here. Uh, to uh, decide. I have a few places, but uh, I'm open to suggestions. So again, thanks for coming and I uh, hope to see you next month.